So this right here is a box. And we can delete that. And this over here is extraneous, so we're going to delete that. And this part, this is all the waste from, this is what Sketchless would have listed as waste. So now we've got our part, our box. Whoops, there's a little, there's another piece right there. Oops. All right, so let's get rid of that. So now we've got just the parts that we need for the most part. I'm going to move this to the center. So I've selected everything. You can see how it's all dotted lines and it turned red. This command here aligns the objects. I'm just going to put them in the center of the board. I could make this a board the same size as the part, but just for demonstration purposes, it's a little bit easier to see if we actually cut it out and you can see that there's sides and waste around it. All right. Now, the only thing that we have to really change over here from what Dave per, uh, get, sent us out is the toe kick here really needs to be cut out. So when we cut this border of our, when we cut the side of our cabinet out of our sheet of plywood, we want the bit to come across this way, not out here. So I'm going to come in here and do a trim command. Get rid of that. Come on, get rid of that. Okay. Now let's see if that, notice how sketch, uh, V-Carve already created a single box for the most part. There's a, we're missing something at the top here. So what we're going to do now, because a lot of these are individual lines rather than entire closed vectors. And no CNC program likes dealing with individual open boxes or open lines. So we're going to select everything, and we're going to come over to Join Open Vectors. Anytime you're bringing anything into vCarve as a DXF file, you're going to want to do this because we need to be able to join these things together. So if we look at this, we have 5,470 open vectors. We've got a tolerance fit in here. Now, usually the tolerance starts out really, really tiny, but in our case, we're going to leave it a little bit higher. It's 40 thousandths of an inch. It was probably preset there from another job I was doing. But you want a number that's big enough to connect lines that are visually touching in the CAD program, even if they're not technically connected. But you don't want the number so high that lines that are just near each other start connecting randomly. So usually something around 10 thousandths of an inch works pretty well. But we have 34 closed vectors and no open vectors when this is all done, which is sounds like it should be about right. So I'm going to hit join. So now that should be one complete line going around, and it is our border. This should be a line. This is a line. And that's a, that's a well, it's a closed vector. It's not a line. And then, we have, of course, we have the individual circles here. So we're in good shape. This is pretty nice. So I'm going to close that out. Now we have a DXF that we can work with. A couple of things we should do before we get too crazy. One is all of these holes, since the these are all going to be dealt with as a single unit, we're going to group them together. And by doing that, I don't have to select all of them every time I want to do something with them. All I have to do is click any one of them, and they all they're grouped. The other thing I want to do is this dado and the one at the top here are also going to be grouped together because they are the same depth, the same settings will be used to cut both of them so we can group those together. I did not group the back dado here because at least in my cabinets, I wanted to show you how I do it, but when I make cabinets, this dado is going to be like an eighth of an inch deep, but the back dado is probably going to be at least a quarter, or if not three eighths of an inch. So we handle that as a separate piece. Anybody got any questions so far? All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go from uh, this side of VCarve as our drawing side. If we were actually drawing things or changing things in VCarve, we could do that here. One of the things VCarve does very, very nicely is lettering. So literally, we could you know come in and do some text in here. I mean, why would you have text inside a cabinet? But you know what I mean. 
But anyway, we're going to switch over to the toolpath commands now. And I'm going to move this over to here. Any number of toolpath options that we can work with. And which what we want to choose here sets some parameters that we need to think about. But by choosing the right icon or the right type of toolpath here, we can save ourselves a lot of time. The first thing we're going to do is the holes. You always want to work whenever you're working with a cat with a CNC machine, you want to, as much as possible, you want to work from the inside outward. We, we want to get all of the internal details done before we cut the piece out, because even if we're using a vacuum hold down system like you would in the industry, or if you're using tabs to hold it, because, you know, I don't have vacuum on my little baby CNC at work or at, at the shop, <clears throat> You don't want that piece to move because if it moves and you haven't cut all these holes or whatever, everything's going to be messed up. If the part moves slightly as you finish cutting it out and that's the last thing you're doing, it's less of a critical issue. So we always want to be able to do, um, we always want to be able to do work as much as possible from the outside, from the inside outward. So let's start here. And who was it that was really interested in doing the holes? Is that you, Don? <clears throat> yeah, uh, yeah, we had a little difficulty with that, but yes. But you can see here they're working quite nicely. Uh, so yeah, I do. <laughs> there's two ways that we can manage these holes. We can do them as pockets, individual pockets, or we can manage them as a drill step. And it depends on your CNC machine and what you're doing. If I were doing this piece on my little baby machine at home, I would use a bit that's a little bit smaller than a quarter, probably a 3 16 and I would basically tell the machine to do these as pockets, and it would essentially plunge in and do a little swirl maneuver to drill each of these holes out to the proper dimension. Right. If you do a drill up, it's pretty hard on the machine, especially smaller ones, right? Yeah, and it's definitely hard on the bits because router bits don't like, you know, they're not designed to drill. Um, but we do also have a drill command over here in which we can, and this thing's running slow. Come on, drawing tool path. Okay, so cut depth is, in this case, is gonna be 0.375. Uh, we're gonna use a quarter inch drill because we can. Um, Vectric gives me the op opportunity to do peck drilling. We're only going in three, three eighths of an inch, so we probably don't need to do that, but if you're drilling deeper, it will actually you know, you can set it up to go in a little bit, come back out and clear chips, go in a little more, come back out and clear chips. It's a pretty nice setup. Usually you would use this with drills. Um, you know, a lot of higher end industrial CNCs actually have honest to God drill bits on them and they spin at a much lower rate. So you can do this kind of thing, but we're really not gonna do this because we're mostly concerned with smaller CNCs. So we're gonna do them in all those pockets. So again, the cut depth is going to be 0.375. I'm going to use a 3 8 end mill, and that way it'll go in and do its thing. It doesn't really matter if you're clearing the pockets with offset or raster. Raster is usually side to side. Sometimes you want to use this, especially if you're doing working in solid woods. You can do you can use the raster command in order to cut with the grain so you don't get as much tear out. Um, this raster angle is at zero, but if I put it at 90, it would go the other way. You can, you have all kinds of control over that. But anytime there's a pocket that's round or, you know, um, I'm not really concerned with, with the grain, I'm gonna use the offset because it starts at the center and works its way out. And for holes, that's perfect. The other advantage to doing your holes as pockets is that if we decided suddenly that we wanted these to be five millimeter instead of four, uh, instead of quarter inch, which in a cabinet is not unusual, or if you're doing a cutout for a pass through or an electrical uh, piece or whatever, you can change the drawing. And because you're interpolating the hole, starting in the middle and working the outs to the out to the final uh, diameter, you can make those changes much more easily. You don't have to go back in and redraw the holes at the new dimension. So um, that works, you know, it, it just, it's a little bit easier to work with. The other thing I'm doing here is I'm ramping my plunge moves. And what that means is we just talked about drilling and how we don't really like to go straight in with a drill bit, uh, a router bit into the wood. 
just like when you're using a hand router, you, you know, if you're using a plunge router by hand, you kind of start the bit and move the plunge router along the part while you're plunging so that you get a ramping maneuver. This does the same thing automatically within DCARD. Uh, so I usually set the ramp to a little bit more than the either the diameter of the bit or a little bit less. So we'll go for 093. It doesn't really matter. You just don't need it to be too long. But it's just enough to keep the bit from going straight in. So in this case, the bit is actually going to swirl its way back and forth down in, into the wood. Um, and then, we, you know, always name your tool paths just so you can find them again later. This is going to be a very simple program, but it's always a good, um, it's always a good habit to get into to label your tool paths because you may want to move them around or correct them later. And if you've got 20 tool paths, then you're going to want to be able to find the one you want. So we can hit calculate. VCARB automatically shifts over to the 3D uh, preview. And you can see this is our, the red line is the actual fast travel of the head in between cuts. And if you look very closely, you can see there's little tiny, tiny blue lines in here. Let me see if I can zoom into one. So this is the actual tool pathing of the individual holes. But it's only showing you the actual path of the center of the bit at this point. So this is just before um, we preview it. Now we can go ahead and do a preview. And you can see that we've got holes there. One of the cool things about the preview feature here in uh, VCARV is we can actually do a fill color for the tool pathing so that we can actually see, I don't know if the yellow is gonna show up, let's do it in red. So it actually shows you where there's a cut that's not all the way through. If it goes all the way through, it'll be the same blue as the background here, but this allows you to see the detail when you, know, you might not be able to otherwise. So it's a pretty cool thing. And you can move this around, you can zoom in and out, and you can also look at your parts from different angles. So this is a really helpful um, feature being able to do this preview because it really definitely um, it, it definitely gives us a, a much better view of what we're doing and we can kind of test things out before we actually cut any material. So now we're going to kick back to the 2D view and we're going to select our dados here. Again, <clears throat> If I'm using a industrial level CNC with a tool changer, I'm gonna select the right tool for the job for each of these steps. In this case, my machine doesn't have a tool changer. I'm gonna stick with the 3 16th inch bit, even though it means that this cut, you know, plowing out these two pockets will take a little longer, it's a lot less hassle and a lot less time than swapping bits in the middle of the program. So we'll just keep this all at the 3 16th inch bit. So once again, we're gonna do a pocket. This time we only want the pocket to be an eighth of an inch deep. We're gonna use the same tool. We're still gonna be doing ramps. We're still gonna be doing an offset. And we'll call these uh, deck dados. And now you can see the blue lines here are the actual tool path. Now the, the blue lines represent the center of the bit as it's going around, not the outside, the diameter, just the center line of the bit. But when we do the preview, then it'll show us the actual tool path. So I'm gonna preview the selected tool path and there you go. So now we've got those two dados all set up and we've got the deck dados and we've got the shelf pins. And all right, so we close that out again. Now we're gonna come into the back dado. And this one's three quarters of an inch. Usually it could, it could be a half an inch, it doesn't really matter, but we're gonna do the same thing again. We're gonna use the pocketing tool path. This time we're gonna to cut to three eighths of an inch and we're going to call this back dado. <clears throat> Calculate that out, same exact thing, and we're going to preview that toolpath as well. Set all. Oops. 
All right. So now we've got our dados. And if you, again, if we zoom in here, if we do an isometric view and we zoom into that corner, you can see that we have a deeper dado on top of a thinner dado or a shallower dado. So this is the preview function is very, very valuable to make sure that you're getting the results you want. There's, you know, there's no way you're going to be able to tell if this is exactly, you know, one inch from the back like you wanted it or whatever. You just don't have that kind of resolution. But you do have the opportunity here to get a good idea of whether or not you're going to be ruining a piece of wood before you cut. All right, so we can close out of that, come back here. Now we're going to select our outside profile. And this time we're going to do a profile toolpath because we're cutting it out. So now we've got to go to 0.75 inches for depth. And we're going to use the same 3 16 end mill. Again, we could switch to another one, but since I don't have a tool changer, I'm not going to bother. Now here with the machine vectors, we get to choose. Right now we're going to do outside and right. Uh, right and left is kind of a little sketchy, but we're cutting to the outside. And the reason that this is important is because the machine and the G code that's written for the machine is all based on the center line of the bit. And if we just cut this, if we cut the bit along the, so that the center line of the bit was along our cut line here, what we would end up with is a piece that's a uh, 3 16 of an inch too small. So the bit has to actually shift outside the line by half of its diameter or uh, 3 30 seconds of an inch. And then it'll cut on the right path. Now, if you side, you can do that as well. And you notice that the graphic here shows you the change. Now, this is the yellow disc represents the bit. It's cutting along the edge of that box. And here, it's cutting along the outside of the box. We also do have the option of cutting right on the line. And there are times when you want to do that, but not in this case. And you can also do conventional milling or climb cutting. <clears throat> I almost always climb cut with a CNC. Um, I climb cut with a hand router quite often too, even though it's a little bit less easy to control. But with the CNC, you don't, you don't have the control issues. So climb cutting works very nicely. And especially in hardwoods and solid woods, it tends to splinter less. So I always do climb cutting that way. All right. Once again, we are going to ramp the plunge moves. The cool part about this is that when we ramp, the bit starts, well, in this case, it's going to start in this corner where the green dot is. And it's going to move a quarter of an inch to get down to the first pass depth. Um, and because we're doing three quarters of an inch and our bit is at uh, three, eight, uh, three sixteenths of an inch deep, it's going to take several passes. But what's really cool is that the software will automatically overrun the starting point by the same distance so that it cuts the ramp away at once it's done making its path around it'll cut the ramp away the existing ramp before it starts the next one so in reality it's going to start here and then the next pass will start there and the next pass will start there it's kind of cool so it does all that automatically for you oops now again <clears throat> when in the industry, we have a full sheet of plywood thrown on the table of our machine, and we've got a 20 horsepower vacuum pump that's drawing air through the system and holding all the parts in place. If you have that, you don't need to do tabs or any other holding method. The vacuum is more than enough. But in this case, because I'm using a, a benchtop CNC, I, gotta, I have to have tabs to keep the piece from moving. And even when you have vacuum, if the piece is small enough or oddly shaped, Sometimes I'll use tabs just to keep them from moving because the vacuum is most effective the larger the part. It's all a question of how many square inches are being sucked down by the vacuum, how well it holds. So tabs are a good thing. So we can set the depth of our tabs and we're going to go for 3 sixteenths. Oops, that's the length, sorry. Let's do 0.25. And then the thickness of our tabs will go to three sixteenths. And if I go to advanced options here, I can actually do 3D tabs as well, which I prefer. And I'll show you what that means in a minute. So I can set the tabs based on a constant number. So if I do like 
four tabs here and I do add tabs, it's going to put four tabs, but they're going to be randomly positioned, not randomly, they're positioned at equal distances around the perimeter. And th there's a problem with this for me because I have a tab on the corner here. I have another one on the corner here and another one on the corner here. Yeah, I, was, I was wondering about that. Well, they'll work as tabs, but the problem is when I go to clean them up after the fact, they're going to be twice as hard to clean up and sand smooth because they're in the corners. So I generally don't do that. Um, now, I can just move these tabs by selecting them and moving them, or I can just click them to make them go away. I almost always add the tabs manually because I know where I want them. So I don't mind... I love tabs back here in the back because this is the back of the cabinet. You're never going to see it. I don't care. That's fine. And then I'll probably put one on the toe kick here because there's enough room in the middle of the toe kick to, you know, get a sanding block in there and clean that off. But it's also the toe kick. So it's going to get covered. I don't care if there's a mark there from the machine from the tab after I'm done. If I leave tabs off of the visible surfaces, then there's less cleanup that I have to do after the fact. And three tabs on a piece this size should be plenty. So we'll leave that in. And we've got our ramps. And so now we can call this cutout. And we'll calculate that. And then preview the selected tool path. And now if we zoom in here, there's our tab. You can see it there, and it's a little hard to see because it's at the bottom of a three-quarter inch well, but the 3D tab, uh, if you don't use 3D tab, what you get is the bit comes across, lifts up, moves over, drill, drills back in, and keeps going again. And that's fine for the most part, but it's still, it goes against my, my desire to ramp everything. The 3D tab the bit comes over and it actually cuts a ramp up to the height of the tab and down back down through the material at the end. So when you do the 3D tab, you do wanna make them a little bit thicker and maybe a little bit wider than you would normally so that they don't break away on their own volition. But you get used to doing the tabs and it's pretty easy to keep, keep track of and figure out as you go. So basically, now if I redo this and I'm going to just to show you something. I'm going to get rid of the tabs. And let's recalculate that. And it, it automatically defaults to the first line name. Um, we don't want to call it that. So we're going to call it, uh, you know, cabinet side one. Especially if you're working in, in Get used to calling your or your naming conventions and your file conventions. Start from the very beginning using a system that makes some logical sense so that you can find what you're looking for. Um, that's one of the biggest problems. When I started out with CNCs, you had like six or eight characters that you could name a program, which was an absolute nightmare because, you know, if you're making cabinets, then you want to call those parts out by the job name and then the cabinet and then the name of the part of that cabinet in that job name, it was an absolute nightmare. Now you've got much longer strings that you can use, but sometimes the little pen, handheld pendant that you use only has so many characters available on the screen. So although the name in the computer could be quite long, you're only seeing the first several characters. So I've learned to, rather than call this cabinet side one, I might want to call it, um, you know, um, Dave right side. And that way, you know, the identifier is first, so I'll see that more. But whatever you want to call it, you can. Now, the other thing you can do over here, remember we talked about doing everything from the outside in or from the inside out. Let's say we wanted to do the shelf pins after the dados. It doesn't really matter because they're both internal. So I can move the shelf pins around the shelf pin toolpath by just clicking the up and down buttons. And I can move any of them around that way because when I did the output, these steps are gonna be done in order. And let's take a quick look. Where did I save that to anyways? 
Uh, hopefully right on the desktop. Yep, okay, cool. So if we go back to my desktop here, and are you still seeing my desktop? Or no, my screen sharing is paused. All right, hang on. Oh, are you? Okay. Uh, let's see, screen right here, share. All right. So here's the tap file, which is what I just created. Now, in, for the CNC shark, the suffix on the, the, the what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, it's a tap file, so it's a TAP instead of a DXF or whatever else. Some are called NC, some are called CNC. There's all kinds of different um, uh, you know, naming conventions, but for this is what the CNC shark is going to look for, so that's where it, what it is. I can open this, by the way, in open with. This is nothing but a text file, so I can open it in Notepad. And there's my G code. Let me, yeah, let's see, I'm gonna move this out of the way again. Shorten this up a little bit. All right, so the cool thing is that the first part of the code that's output is notes for the operator. So the name is Dave Wright side, the file creation from CNC Sharp for Vectric, material size right here, origins, safe zones, everything that I'm doing in toolpaths, shelf pins, deck data, back data, cutout, tools used in this file. It's all here. So if you open up a file that you wrote five years ago and you can't remember what tool you used, now you've, it's all right here for you. So then as we scroll down, this is why it's called the G code. Notice all these lines starting with G. Those are standardized lines, a G0, a G1, a G2, G20, G90. All of these codes do a particular task or instruct the machine to do a particular task. A G1 is a simple move. We're going to go from wherever we are right now, which is this position, at a feed rate of 20. It's going to then move to this position. And then it's going to move to this position, this position. Now, in this case, you'll notice these are all Z changes. Um, and there are some uh, Y changes. So this is actually, we're starting with the drilling of the holes. So this is the interpolation and it goes on bloody well forever because we've got 24 holes, each one that needs to be done over and over and over again. So this is what you're seeing here. And then at some point, we should see another note line most of the program is exactly what we're seeing here. And each one of these blocks is a hole being drilled because it's not just the, the, the plunge move in Z. If we were doing a drilling command, this would just be a one line Z drill in and out. But this is interpolating the hole. So it's actually rotating the bit quarter by quarter. It works in quadrants. And that's why there's so much information here. But let's see if we can figure out where the You see how far? Okay, there we go. So if you can see my little cursor here, this is the slider for this program. Everything up above here was just drilling the holes. Now we're doing the deck dados here. But see how this is divided out? So I know that this is the deck dados, it says so. My feed rate of 40 is my moving rate. 20 is the plunge. We're going in. There's the back dado. There's the cutout. So being able to read the G code, which I had to learn way back when, um, allows me to actually, if a program doesn't work properly, I can look at the G code. And if the G code is right, then I know that there's a machine issue going on, something mechanical. If the G code isn't correct, then it's a software issue or the wrong post processor or something. But I can go in here and make changes to this if I want to. And in doing so, if I simply resave it as a tap file, I've just changed the G code. So um, I don't often do that, but every now and again, I'll get around to doing it. Um, all right, I'm gonna go back to sharing. Um, VCarve. All right, so any questions, anybody? Just uh, thank you for the great presentation on VCarve. 